Thank you all so much for coming out. It's freezing cold, it's been snowing, and it's been a long two months. So uh, myself and all the organizations represented here really appreciate y'all coming out. My name is Ryan Harvey. I speak to you as a lifelong Baltimorean and as a proud member of the Service Employees International Union Local 500. I'm also part of an ad hoc coalition called Greater Baltimore Residents for a Ceasefire. A few weeks ago, we heard that some of our elected officials felt that they had not heard enough from their constituents regarding calls for a ceasefire in Israel-Palestine. Despite all the protests, despite the massive sit-ins, despite over 200,000 people marching in Washington, D.C. So a small group of friends and I decided to write a simple letter backing up that demand. We thought, let's try to get 25 Baltimore area organizations and small businesses signed on. We thought this number was both substantial and realistic. We quickly surpassed that number. Then we surpassed 50. Then 75. As of this morning, we have over 170 local organizations and small businesses signed on to this letter saying ceasefire now. These groups represent more than 200,000 people in the greater Baltimore area. They're healthcare workers, students, racial justice organizers, housing justice organizers, lawyers, Muslims, Jews, Christians, refugees, immigrants, civil rights defenders, street violence prevention activists, environmentalists, veterans, journalists, feminists, queer youth leaders, artists, bakers, cooks, construction workers, farmers, therapists, priestess, tattoo artists, hairstylists, personal trainers, pizza makers, chocolate makers, ice cream makers. This is a whole community. These are regular people who have felt it necessary to put their names and the names of their businesses in the public record because what they see happening is so deeply wrong. There are organizations who know that what's happening 5,844 miles away in Gaza is tied to their fight for racial, economic, and political justice here in Baltimore. So we're gathered here today to send a very strong and very public message to our members of Congress. Baltimore demands an immediate ceasefire, and we aren't going away until it happens. So I'd like to thank the 170 plus organizations and small businesses who've added their name to this letter, and in particular, those who are represented here today and who've endorsed today's event. I'm not gonna read through all the names because uh, we're short on time. So you'll hear from many of them. So after we hear from some of these groups, a detachment of us is gonna walk across the street and hand deliver a box of 170 letters to Senator Chris Van Hollen. We already this morning sent copies of the letter to Senator Ben Cardin and representatives John Sarbanes and Dutch Rupertsberger. So I want to bring up our first speaker. I forgot to even put your last name in here, Matan, and I am sorry, so introduce yourself. But we're going to introduce Matan, who is with If Not Now, Baltimore, which is an organization of young Jews working to end the occupation of Palestine. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you. Can we get a big round of applause for everyone who made today's event happen? As Ryan said, my name is Matan Zemmer. I'm proud to be here today with such a powerful, impressive coalition of organizations and businesses and individuals. I'm here as a descendant of Holocaust survivors, as an American Jew with family in Israel and friends in the West Bank who are currently facing 
horrifying settler state violence. And I'm here as a representative of If Not Now Baltimore. If Not Now is a movement of American Jews organizing our community to end U.S. support for Israel's apartheid system and demand equality, justice, and a thriving future for all Palestinians and Israelis. I'd like to make three quick points. First, as we stand here today, and each passing day, the Israeli military is killing hundreds of Palestinians as hundreds of thousands in Gaza are being subjected to hor horrific conditions, starvation, denial of access to critical medical care, displacement, and constant fear of death. What we're seeing is undeniably state-sanctioned genocide, and it's completely unjustifiable. Two, the only way to end this violence, to secure a hostage exchange that will bring everyone home, and to forge a path forward to a long-term political solution that will ensure equality, justice, and safety for all Palestinians and Israelis, is to push for a lasting ceasefire. <laughs> ceasefire now! Ceasefire now. Ceasefire now. Ceasefire now. My third and final point is, it is absolutely shameful that the U.S. government is actively supporting Israel's continued bombardment and destruction of Gaza. The, the Biden administration is currently trying to send billions in weapons to Israel that the administration itself knows will be used to commit war crimes in Gaza. Shame. The U.S. cannot provide a blank check to an Israeli government that has made clear its intentions are to wreck as much destruction on Gaza and the West Bank as possible and kill tens of thousands of Palestinians. We say, no money for war crimes. No money for war crimes. While it is worth recognizing Senator Van Hollen's support for conditioning aid to Israel, this falls flat without a lasting ceasefire. We will continue to show up we will continue to disrupt business as usual, and we will continue to make our voices heard alongside millions of others until those who represent us, who, who represent us will use their power and their leadership to put an end to these atrocities. Ceasefire now! Ceasefire now! Ceasefire now! Thank you, Matan. Next up, I'm gonna bring up Ida Kenna, who is a member of the Greater Baltimore Democratic Socialists of America, a signatory to this letter and one of the groups who helped make today happen. First of all, um, on behalf of the ESA, I'm really, really proud to be part of this coalition. Um, it means a lot to me. I think it's... As a member of the DSA, um, I'm really, really proud to be part of this coalition. I think this is really our start towards building a mass movement, not just in the world, but in Baltimore, a place where we like haven't seen what we've seen in DC and Chicago, but we're clearly we really are ready for that. Um, to start, homelessness in the U.S. increased more in 2023 than in any recorded year prior, with lack of rent stabilization and an end to pandemic assistance. We are governed by people who celebrate the economy anyway and who read in polls that the majority of Americans want a permanent ceasefire for Israel and for USA to be conditioned on human rights, then decide to support genocide anyway. DSA is proud to have organized hundreds of thousands of phone calls in our No Money for Massacres campaign and joined mass actions with groups like US Campaign for Palestinian Rights and If Not Now. At the start, it was the DSA electeds who introduced the Ceasefire Now resolution, our representative to leave, very proud. Now, 58 signatures are on there, despite multiple people being censured. We've seen repression also in schools, unions, and humanitarian organizations, such as CASA. Our federal government has declared... Our federal government has declared even our Jewish comrades to be anti-Semites, while the biggest source of anti-Semitism in this country, the Republican Party, convinces their only electoral opposition to abandon the welfare of asylum seekers and refugees, which, shame. Shame! We've mourned with fury as the repression is manifested as racist and Islamophobic violence domestically, all while millions of Palestinians are being murdered, demonized, and displaced, while Israeli forces are killing their own citizens in their frenzy to erase the former inhabitants of the land they occupy. 
While popularity of the political establishment drops, more unions, mandatory organizations, and even governments around the world are demanding a permanent ceasefire. A mass movement is growing, even as many realize it isn't enough that we have to abolish Israeli apartheid and dismantle U.S.-led imperialism. We need full housing, a livable minimum wage, good welfare, and an end to the U.S.-funded genocide and sabotage of working class and resistance movements throughout the world. With unions growing stronger, the working class sees this country for what it is and is ready to inform itself further and build something better. We implore our comrades to consider what kind of political organization we need to achieve a free Palestine and a better world. Not just as workers or voters, but as a unified internationalist working class that can overpower the interests of the capitalist establishment in government and outside of it, we will win. If stopping a genocide isn't enough to convince Senator Van Hollen to join our and 57 of his colleagues' demands for a ceasefire, then we will have to replace him. Palestine will be free. Ceasefire now. Ceasefire now. Ceasefire now. Next up, we're going to hear from Haroi Hadgu, who represents the Progressive Democrats of Howard County. He, he's also an active member of the Howard County NAACP and is a founding member of the newly formed Howard County for a Free Palestine Coalition. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Haroi Hadgu. I'm part of uh, Progressive Democrats of uh, Howard County. I'm part of uh, the Progressive Democrats of Howard County, and I'm also a member of the uh, Howard County for Free Palestine. Uh, let's reflect for a moment that uh, we should not have, we should not be doing this today. We should not have to say cease fire. This is a, this is a matter of basic human decency. That's right. Um, we are emphatically calling on Senator Van Hollen to support an immediate and permanent ceasefire in the ongoing conflict between uh, uh, Israel and Palestine. Since October 7, the Israeli military's aggression have resulted in over 20,000 Palestinians dead, with nearly half being children. These aren't just numbers. They represent the relatives and loved ones um, of many, including in, uh, residents of Maryland. The grief and loss experienced by families of the conflict are immeasurable and deeply felt in our communities. The situation in Gaza is dire. Israel's blockade has cut off essential supplies like water, electricity, fuel, and other necessities. The residents of Gaza are on the brink of starvation. Indeed, many are already in a state of starvation. Over two million people have been displaced from their homes, creating a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions. Despite warnings from UN experts about the risk, about the grave risk of genocide in Gaza, the response from the Biden administration has been disheartening. Shame. Shame. With no clear stance taken against these actions, Meanwhile, a significant majority of Americans are voicing their support for a ceasefire. Our concerns extend to the use of our taxpayer dollars. Billions have been allocated to support Israel's military actions in Gaza. While here at home, we struggle to secure significant public, sufficient public resources to address the basic needs of our own communities. Shame! Shame. It is a matter of grave concern that our contributions are not being used in a way that perpetuates violence and suffering. On Monday, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announced Operation Prosperity Guardian to protect commercial shipping routed to Israel. Commercial shipping. Where is Operation Prosperity Guardian to protect Palestinian babies? Yeah. Right. We're urging Senator Van Hollen to, cons to consider this grave situation 
and join in our call for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Thank you. Elected school board commissioners, Ashley Esposito. Thank you all. I was really struggling on what to say today. I want to start off by thanking every woman of color, especially black and indigenous women, who put their necks out to sign on, show up, speak out, knowing that they carry the most risk. I hope this space understands that risk, the risk of speaking truth while having the most to lose. In this space, you all should be thankful for the sacrifices that women of color make. You should remember this when you prop up leaders who carry less risk or mediocre at best, but have been given more grace than women of color. Institutions, organizations, voters, groups that have political power should remember this when you are donating, volunteering, through your endorsement process, and at the ballot box where people stand. For people who are adverse to conflict, and if this resonates with you, sometimes accountability feels like an attack. When people are showing you their pain, their trauma, or crying for help, the least you can do is bear witness. No one should have the right to comfort, not even me. I've been paying attention to Israel and Palestine well before 2023. I'll never forget the images of moms holding their lifeless babies who are the same age as my son. What continues to keep me up at night is knowing the widespread trauma will impact everyone, everyone that does survive, and future generations. When I ran for the seat, I ran on the principle that we cannot rely on individualism. Individualism and education and family shows up as people saying, I'll focus on my kid and my community, and you focus on yours. I ran to fight for our kids. Yeah. And so right now, I am shouting from Baltimore to Gaza, I will fight for your kids too. <laughs> but it's a lie. I have a friend that created a space for black mothers to come together and decompress. We were going around the room sharing the fatigue that we have to call out injustices, discrimination, racism, and all the other isms. It can be isolating. People will attack us, defund us, they will work in the shadows and in the media to attack our character. And when describing my own experiences of calling out injustice, I told them, I'm not wrong, I'm early. Woo! Yes! We don't have time to wait for those who are late or indifferent. Indifference and apathy are positions of privilege. We all know how dangerous indifference can be. You cannot speak of inequities or harm in Baltimore City and feel indifferent about what is happening in Gaza. In this city, indifference gave us lead paint poisoning, redlining, over-policing, discrimination, the school to prison pipeline, just to name a few. Globally, indifference gave us the slaughter of millions of indigenous people. Some tribes don't even exist. Indifference gave us slavery. Indifference led to the assassination of our civil rights leaders. Indifference gave us mass incarceration. Indifference allowed the Holocaust to happen. Today, indifference is creating the cruelty that continues in Gaza. You cannot possibly see the numbers of civilians being killed, especially children, and look me straight in my face and tell me you, and have the audacity to call this a war. Angela Davis predicted this moment in 2015 and she said, how would you explain the popularity of the narrative that the oppressed have it to ensure the safety of their oppressors? Placing the question of violence at the forefront almost inevitably serves to obscure the issues that are at the center of the struggles for justice. This occurred in South Africa during the anti-apartheid struggle. Interestingly, Nelson Mandela, who has been sanctified as the most important peace advocate of our time, was kept on the U.S. terrorist list until tw uh, 2008. The important issue in Palestine's struggle for freedom and self-determination are minimized and rendered invisible by those who are trying to equate Palestinian resistance 
to Israeli apartheid with terrorism. I am proud to stand here with you all, the ones who dare to be early, you who have the political will to hold people accountable, all of you who dare to bear witness every day, not just today, people who are 10 toes down on principle. This is a call in to support human rights. This is a call in to have the conversation that we've needed to have for a very long time. This is a call for an immediate ceasefire and a permanent ceasefire. Not tomorrow, not next month, now. Yeah. His yes. History will show that all of us are on the right side of humanity, freedom, and peace. We are not wrong, we are just early. Our next speaker is Hussaitha Mohammed, a recent graduate of the University of Maryland and a representative of the Maryland Office of the Council on American Islamic Relations, America's largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. but it's still okay? great to be here. Um, my name is Zayfa Muhammad. I am speaking on behalf of the Maryland Office of the Council on American Islamic Relations. The Council on American Islamic Relations is America's largest Muslim civil rights. And before I begin, I just want to say that we are proud to be part of this unprecedented growing movement that believes all innocent life is sacred, whether it's Palestinian or Israeli, Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, and it all must be protected equally. A brutal occupation force has besieged the entire Gaza Strip, a strip of land smaller in area than the city of LA, and one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. Its civilian population has been deprived of food, water, gas, and electricity. Over 20,000 innocent civilians have been murdered, nearly half of them children, a civilian death toll unprecedented and unseen in prior conflicts. Civilian infrastructure has been destroyed. Countless doctors, members of the press, and international humanitarian aid workers um, have put their lives on the line trying to save what little is left, many of whom have also been killed. This, almost half the time, the state of Israel uses unguided bombs that kill and destroy indiscriminately. White phosphorus is also being used as well, which is illegal under international law, sticks to skin, and can spread fire over hundreds of square yards. How can you stand with those that won't distinguish between civilians and combatants? While we stand here, more and more Palestinian lives are being lost, and the death toll will only continue to grow. Representatives such as that office over there claim to serve their constituents. But what about the countless Palestinian Americans in Maryland pleading with our representatives to support a ceasefire and end the current conflict? Their family members' lives are on the line and those who serve them in Congress refuse to do anything. That's why we stand here today with over 150 grassroots organizations and 155 nations to let our representatives know that their constituents and citizens of all faiths and backgrounds call for a permanent ceasefire in this conflict. Thank you. Next, I want to bring up Rabbi Ariana Katz, who's the founding rabbi of Hinenu, the Baltimore Justice Stiebel, a synagogue here in the city rooted in joy, the pursuit of justice, and radical kinship. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so honored to be here with all of you and that our congregation, Hinenu, was able to sign on to a letter in defense of Palestinian life. I want to bring a verse from Leviticus for us. Not often a text that brings a lot of comfort, but a verse that says, Lo ta'amod al dam re'echa. Do not stand idly by your neighbor's blood. Perhaps you've been told by your families, your politicians, your bosses, that you just don't understand. 
that calling for a ceasefire is short-sighted or naive. Perhaps someone has even gone as far as to tell you that calling for a ceasefire is in fact dangerous for other life. Lo ta'amod al damra'acha, do not idly stand by your neighbor's blood. Our Torah teaches that we are obligated, we are obligated not just to take action to defend life, but to understand that our inaction is also reprehensible and something for which we are accountable. So we are here to say to Senator Chris Van Hollen that your inaction, your inaction is noticeable and is at the cost of thousands and thousands and thousands of Palestinian lives. We know, we know that more death cannot bring back those who have already been killed in Israel on October 7th and in Gaza in the weeks and weeks and heinous weeks since. And so we are here, I am here on behalf of my congregation of over 200 families and the progressive radical Jewish voice that is rising here in Baltimore to say, to say lo ta'amod al dam ra'acha, do not idly stand by your neighbor's blood any longer. To the people of Gaza, to the people of Palestine, we will not stop rising for you. We are with you, our hearts are breaking for you, and we are acting in your memory. May the memories of those who have been so brutally murdered in the last two months be for a blessing. May we rise in their honor. I now want to bring up Sefa Santos Powell with 1199 SEIU United Healthcare Workers East, which represents 10,000 healthcare workers throughout Maryland and Washington, D.C. And the larger SEIU 1199 East represents 400,000 workers in the East, and they have come out in support of a ceasefire only this week. Sefa. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, from Baltimore to Palestine, ceasefire now! Ceasefire now! My name is Sefa Santos Powell and I'm proud to be here representing 1199 SEIU Maryland, D.C. A, la <laughs> a labor union representing 10,000 healthcare workers in Maryland and D.C. to demand a ceasefire. There is absolutely no justified reason to bomb hospitals, homes, and communities that Apartheid and occupation are a public health crisis, violate human rights, and cause great harm to people's access to health care and general well-being. 1199 SEIU was the first union in the U.S. to oppose war in Vietnam, and we are proud that during the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, 1199 stood with Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress. As advocates of global justice and global health, 1199 SEIU is speaking out against the occupation and calling for a change. This is our reality, but it does not have to be. Building a just world requires solidarity among working people internationally. Palestinian workers, including healthcare workers, have issued many calls to the rest of the world to speak out against the occupation of Palestine. As a healthcare workers union, we understand the power of standing united with workers across the world, especially those facing systemic, systemic racism and violence under global capitalism. Lastly, we must call on our representatives to end inhumane and cruel treatment that has been justified as necessary collateral damage. This moment in Baltimore is a moment of history, and it is my honor to join over 170 organizations in the city to call on our representatives in our city to stand on the right side of history. The people united will never be defeated. Next up, we're gonna hear from Wissam Awadala. He is a Palestinian American, rank and file member of Teachers and Researchers United, a union representing 3,200 grad students at Johns Hopkins University. True is affiliated with the United Electrical Workers Union, the first national union to call for a ceasefire. Hi, good afternoon everybody. I'm Wissam Awadala, uh, Lego State. Justice for all. 
where organization holds consultative status at the United Nations and advocates for the global strengthening of human rights. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. When one side does not have a navy, does not have an air force, does not have an army, this is not a war. This is genocide. I come to speak to you on behalf of Justice for All. We are an organization that works on genocide prevention, that ju works on minority rights. And today, as we stand outside Senator Van Hollen's office, I've been inside his office many times. I have handed him papers and papers of 880 scholars calling this a genocide. And he's taken a look at this and he says to us, what happens on day one after the ceasefire? That is not our problem, Senator Van Hollen. We need ceasefire now and that is the least of our demands. Uh, we cannot be complicit in this genocide. When we stand up against China for the Uyghur genocide and we prop up everything and we put our, we have bills and resolutions against China, which we should. We have been fighting that genocide for years. But we refuse to recognize the same thing happening in Gaza why? Because our allies are the committers of that genocide? We really need to question ourselves. The language used by the Israeli leaders is not only racist, dehumanizing, but reflect genocidal intent. We must condemn such rhetoric. And it is our moral duty to hold those responsible, accountable for their actions. Closer to home, Baltimore knows two out of 10 people in Baltimore City live under poverty. Where is that tax money? Where is the money to feed our homeless, to house us? It is un uncomfortable that our hard-earned tax dollars are funding a genocide abroad while our communities struggle right here. We've been here, we've, I see some of your faces, we've been here asking for those rights right here. So from Baltimore to Gaza, Palestine will be free. We join this global call for a ceasefire. It is shameful that the United States is the only country in the world that has co voted against this ceasefire at the United Nations. Shame on us. Next, we're gonna hear from Zahi Hamis and Kim Jensen, who are very long time fighters in Baltimore for a free Palestine. Uh, thank you, Ryan, and all the organizers, and thanks to all of you for being out here on this cold day to do what is right. Um, before uh, I read the poem that we, we've come up here to read, um, the atrocities that we are witnessing are unimaginable. It is shocking. It is absolutely unacceptable what is happening in Gaza. It is terrifying that this is happening to human beings on this planet. And so, I really do feel we do need to take just a moment of silence to remember the people, the babies, the hospitals, the, that have been massacred in the last two months. So please join me in that. Honestly, the, 
the whole world should be shutting down right now. In every struggle for resistance, we are empowered when we remember our elders, when we remember our ancestors, when we remember the culture, when we remember where we came from, that this is not a new struggle and people have gone before us. One of the greats um, who gave his life to uh, speaking for the voice of the Palestinian people is Mahmoud Darwish. Uh, Zahi and I will be sharing a poem that we translated. Um, Earth narrows against us. This poem was written after the Sabran Shatila massacre. Uh, and here we are in another phase of massacre. Earth narrows against us. It crowds us into the final passage. We tear off our versions of justice continue amidst the silence and even the tacit support of those in the halls of power in America. We as Americans aren't mere observers of the slaughter of Palestinians. Our labor, the tax dollars we earn, even our votes all materially support this wanton violence. I am here today to tell our elected officials labor in America will not stand for it. <laughs> Unions aren't just to make sure we receive a fair wage. Unions leverage the power of our members to share the strength of the person next to us. Unions are built on the idea of solidarity, that my struggle is your struggle, and that every one of us is equally deserving of life, liberty, and dignity. This includes Palestinians. I stand with my fellow workers in my union, UE, and others, calling for an end to the indiscriminate slaughter of the Palestinian people. Our unions stand for radical change, solidarity, and the fundamental belief in the right to dignity of all mankind. It is our duty to use our voices and our collective power to influence those who claim to represent us to cease abetting these atrocities. Billions of our tax dollars support these horrors. Our labor serves to fuel the injustice in Gaza and Palestine. The U.S. and our elected officials are in a unique position to push for an end to the indiscriminate violence. To our elected officials, your communities, unions across all sectors, and your peers in Congress are telling you cease fire now. It is your duty as our representatives and a moral imperative. Do your part and call for a ceasefire. We are telling you plainly, not in our name, not with our tax dollar. Our labor will not be leveraged to eradicate the people of Palestine. Before I introduce, if uh, uh, Hannah, if you're here, come see me over here by the sound system, please. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Father Ty Hollinger. He's a longtime social justice voice in Baltimore, and he's here today representing the Transfiguration Catholic community, a signatory of the letter. It's good to see so many more here today. What we're doing is working. It is working, and it's powerful. You know, just a few days or a couple of weeks ago, we met across from Representative Thume's office to urge him to sign on to ceasefire now, and he did. Yeah. And I believe it's Senator Van Hollen's time now to do the same, yeah. to push our government who can bring a ceasefire to Gaza by calling Israel to stop the genocide, to stop the killing and to stop the destruction of Palestinians in Gaza. Folks, I'm a, I'm a Catholic priest a Transfiguration. In five short days, Christians around the world will celebrate what began in the West Bank in a little city called Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus. And I call on my Christian sisters and brothers and everybody of goodwill, how do we celebrate Christmas this year with what is happening in the Holy Land, in Gaza, right now, and what has been happening for years and years. We've been silent too long, we've been quiet too long, now is the time to not just 
scream, shout, yell, work for ceasefire now, but to commit ourselves to continue this fight, to continue this struggle until peace does come to Gaza. You know, this baby Jesus that we will remember in five days was born into the world, and he was just like you and me, no matter our faith. Uh, he was taught and he grew up the tradition and the, and the beliefs and the ethics and the morals of his elders. And when, when he had gathered some people close to him as an adult Jesus, and he had the privilege to be an adult with so many youth are not happening, uh, tragically, and, 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 and the catastrophe that's happening to them in Palestine now, when, he, when this Jesus was asked to teach, he, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. They are the ones that are going to be called the children of God. And he also said, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You will be satisfied. There is no one screaming and hungering and thirsting and calling for righteousness and justice now than our sisters and brothers in Gaza and throughout Palestine today. We are with them, though, in solidarity. And we got to hope that the satisfaction of an immediate ceasefire, an immediate end to the killing and the destruction happens. We, we should not have to wait. We can't wait five more days. This should happen today. It should happen at this hour. If it doesn't happen at this hour, the next hour. And can we commit ourselves to continue this movement? This movement here in Baltimore, the sisters and brothers, until this happens. And God willing, may it happen before Christmas because I don't know how to celebrate that feast this year with what's going on with any sense of integrity, but without urging our fellow, uh, my fellow parishioners to take on this call to call for an immediate cease fire now. Not tomorrow, now. So we have a few more speakers. Um, Next up, I want to bring up Hannah Zubari, who's a human rights activist and journalist representing the Baltimore, D.C. Office of Justice. End the occupation now. End the occupation now. End the occupation now. End the occupation now. And before I go, what I want to say, I've always dreamed, always, despite, despite the in the name of Jewish people, Every member of my people have always dreamed of a place there, always thought and imagined that Palestine, in Palestine, we Palestinians are fated to live with Jews. We are fated to live together and figure out a better future for all of us. So I want to say, don't let this criminal genocide on Gaza. Don't let, it, don't let it have you drop any, the last drop of hope for that future, for the future for Palestinian children and Jewish children to figure out one homeland, one national vision, and one future. Thank you very much. We're going to hear from one more duo of speakers, and then we're going to go deliver this letter to Senator Van Hollen's office. Thank you all for standing out here in the cold with us. Uh, to reiterate something I said earlier, this is historic in Baltimore. Our limbs so we can pass. Earth presses us. It rings us. If only we were its wheat, we could die and live again. If only the earth were our mother, she would have mercy on us. If only we were the reflections of the rocks carried by our dream as mirrors. We have seen the faces of those killed in their final defense of the soul, killed by the last of us. We wept at their children's feasts we saw the faces of the ones who will cast our children from the windows of this final expanse. Mirrors that will be burnished by our star. Where do we go after the final crossing? Where do birds fly? Yes. 
Where do birds fly after the last sky? Where do plants sleep after the last breath of air? We will inscribe our names with crimson colored mist. We will cut off the hand of the anthem so it will be completed by our flesh. Here we shall die. Here in the final passage, here or here, our blood will plant its olive groves. And now I would like to introduce Zahi Khamis. He's a Palestinian professor. He's a Palestinian artist. Um, and he'll say a few words. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan, I met you in 2014, at the same time when Israel was bombing the way the way it's bombing Gaza now. It was bombing Gaza then, it was killing children then, it was demolishing whole neighborhoods. It was committing what it usually does. And uh, are you tired, Ryan? We are tired of being targeted, and we are tired of having to talk about that pain. But we are, I met Ken during the first Palestinian Intifada. Are you tired, Ken? I'm, I'm tired. I'm here. Are you guys tired? Yes. We are all tired, but we will not stop. We will not stop standing for justice and for peace and for safety for our children. So I'm not really a public speaker, I'm a teacher. So I speak in class, but outside class, I shut up. And uh, so this morning, Kim forced me to come and speak. She said, you are speaking. I said, no. She said, yeah, you are speaking. Okay. It's hard to speak when there is too much pain in you. It's really hard. But I'll say the following. Much of it has been said. But hopefully there will be one, one syllable in there that will echo something in your heart. The first thing I want to do, I want to state the given. And the given is the following. The United States and Israel and all of their racist imperialist powers combined cannot and will not make my people kneel down and surrender. It will not happen. The minister here speaks about Jesus. Jesus is our homeboy. <laughs> and Jesus, minister, this time, this Christmas, is in Gaza. He will be born in Gaza. And he shall resurrect with Gaza. You see, Israel thinks that by beating us over and over and over and over again, then we will just realize it's hopeless, we meaning Palestinians, and we will give up. They call that the Iron Wall policy strategy. It's an old Zionist strategy, but it has not really brought any fruition. I want to say, here's my calling. Stop the sick, savage, racist genocide against my people. Now. Stop the Nazi-style genocide, American-style and sponsored genocide. Stop it now. Let my people breathe. Let my people live. Leave us alone. We are sick of you. Cease fire immediately and stop murdering our children, you fucking sickos! Yeah! Cease fire and withdraw immediately from Gaza so our displaced people can go back to their neighborhoods, demolished neighborhoods, and to their demolished homes and resurrect them. Yeah! Cease fire and withdraw withdraw and allow for the honorable people of the world to supply Gaza with immediate urgent needs. That's you guys. Yeah. 
We must never forget screaming. We're near this many organizations, let alone small businesses come together like this to demand justice in Palestine. And we can't, we can't even get signs made before the number changes again to the next increment of 10. And sadly, so as these next speakers will ground us like Zahi just did in, in the sad reality that we're in, there's another piece of history that we're living through which is never before have so many journalists been killed in such a short period of time in a war in recorded history. So I want to bring up Lisa Snowden, the editor-in-chief and co-founder of the Baltimore Beat, and Alexis Taylor, the managing editor of the Afro newspaper, which has fought racial, for racial equity and economic advancement for black Americans for 131 years. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lisa. Um, I wanted to say that it's an honor to be able to help my colleagues in Palestine. I also feel like as I'm in front of this microphone, that would be remiss if I did not point out silence from my colleagues here in Baltimore, from the newsrooms here in Baltimore about the death of our colleagues has been deafening and it has been noted. As of December 18th, at least 73 journalists, mostly Palestinian, have been killed since the beginning, since, the beginning, since October 7th. No. Mohammed Jargon, Ahmed Abu Mahadi, Ibrahim Mohammed Lafi, Salma Mukhaimer, Mohammed Al Sahi, Jamal Al Fagawi, Assad Shamlak, Zahir Al Afghani, Saeed Al Tawil, Dua Sharaf, Mohammed Sob, Yasser Abu Namos, Hisham Al Nwahi, Nazmi Al Nadim, Salam Mima, Mahed Kashko, Mohammed Fayez Abu Matur Mal Ab Wahidi, Ahmed Shahab, Maj Fadi Arandas, Hussam Mubarak, Mohammed Abu Hatab, Yusuf Maher Dawas, Mohammed Al Bayari, Abduli Habib, Iyad Matar, Isam Bahar, Mohammed Al Jai, Mohammed Balashwa, Mohammed Abu Hasira, Sameh Al Nadi, Yaya Abu Mani, Khalil Abu Athra, Ahmed Al Kaw, Mohammed Ali, Yaqub Al Barsh. Hani Madhom, Ahmed Fatima, Roshidi Sarai, Mamad Matar, Mohammed Ahmad Labad, Mosab Ashur, Saeed Al Halabi, Hostafa El Saf, Amro Salah Abu Hava, Sari Mansur, Asune Salim, Bilal Jalada, Abdel Halim Awad, Avat Kadora, Jamal Hania, Mohammed Nabil Al Zag, Yaniv Zohar, Asim Al Barsh, Ailet Arnim, Mohammed Maun Ayash Shai Ragiv, Amal Zahed, Raul Adam, Mustafa Baker, Nadir Al -Naz Nazli, Abdullah Darwish, Montasar Al Sawaf, Adam Hasona, 
Hassan Farahala Ola Atala Mohammed Abu Samra Abdul Karim Odeh Shaimer Al Ghazar Shaima I'm sorry Sam Samir Abdul Gala Isan Abdallah Farah Omar Rabi Al Mamari Yani Zohar Ayalet Arneen Shai Regev Roe Idan. As members of Black Press, we know what it means to fight for your brothers and sisters on a common struggle. We stand here today in honor of the journalists, the photojournalists, the photographers, all of the people who have lost their lives. They've given the ultimate sacrifice to put on record what is happening in their communities to their people, what is happening to all of these innocent lives. We know that if you don't put your story on I applaud and appreciate you because I know the great sacrifices that many of you and many of us are making to be here. If you're like me, you've had to take a thought around the risks that many of us take to be a part of this type of movement and solidarity. Let's go ahead and be honest. You've thought about it. You thought about what it would cost you to stand together in this way, calling for the end to the genocide in Gaza. Maybe you thought about the impact that you might encounter on campus. As many students across the country right now are facing pressures from administration because they dare raise their voices for peace. Or maybe you've thought about the impact for you with, with respect to your job. You know, there's polite water cooler conversation that is permissible in many places of employment, but genocide and the American military industrial complex doesn't make for good conversation with coworkers. You've thought about the impact of that for sure. Or maybe in your family, it's not very popular to bring up political issues, but you've dared to say, I'm going to raise the issue anyway. We're human. We think about what might happen to us for daring to stick our necks out and stand for justice. But you know what I thought about as I thought about those questions with respect to my own life? As I kept thinking about it, I moved from the question of what will happen to me, and I turned to the question of what will happen to them if we don't. The truth of the matter is, a few weeks from now, many people will stand and declare the name of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And for many programs that are lifted up in his honor, they'll lift up the caricature of Dr. King, the politically approved version of Dr. King. But they dare not raise the Dr. King, the real human being, who dared to raise his voice against the war in Vietnam where many, even in the black freedom struggle, were telling him to shut up. We need to remember that in the waning years of his life, he was not a popular man or minister. Society had turned on him, the man who was once on the cover of Time magazine, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, that very same king dared to bear his cross. And in the waning years, he was not very popular. And even up to his assassination, he was not a celebrated minister, even in many black Christian circles. But we get the benefit of standing on this side of history. And we can look back from this side of history and realize 
that though Dr. King was not popular, he was right. And so I stand with you today to encourage you. We are not out here for some popularity contest. We are not here to gain more followers online or likes on social media pages. There's something deeper and greater that calls us to this moment. There's something more eternal that makes us stand in the cold together and dare to declare that we will not allow this to happen in our name. I'll say this and I'll shut down as our comrades are joining us. I'll say this. When I think about why I was late today, I was late because my children got out early from school. And I had to go and get my children from school. And my plan was to bring them here with me. But there's something strange going on with teenagers where they don't wear coats during winter anymore. And so I wanted to be, thank you, I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a thoughtful dad and take them to a heated home before I came out here to stand with you. But even, even in that, I had the privilege of going to get my children. I had the privilege of taking them to a warm home. I had the privilege of ensuring their safety before I came to you. And that's a privilege, sadly, that many of our Palestinian siblings do not have today. I recognize my privilege. And I recognize the pain and the bloodshed. And no, our standing together on this corner cannot undo what has already happened. But our standing together to say free Palestine will ensure record what happens to it. Your story won't get told. We say thank you to all of the reporters and journalists who have given their lives to say plainly what the truth is, what is happening in Israel and Gaza right now. We say thank you for your ultimate sacrifice. Ashe. Ashe. Okay, just a few more minutes, folks. If I could get the speakers and just one representative from all the organizations present who signed on to the letter, we're going to walk across the street and we're going to deliver 170 letters to Senator Van Hollen from all these different groups. Go, oh, go to Valentina, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna rally, keep warm for a few minutes till they get back, and then we will uh, go get warm elsewhere. All right. Okay, we're just gonna send a lot of good energy while they're delivering these letters. So what do we want? Ceasefire. What do we want? Ceasefire. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Ceasefire. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Ceasefire. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Ceasefire. When do we want? Massacres are not in vain. That their blood has not been spilled in vain. No, we will stand and give voice to those who cannot speak for themselves. We will dare challenge those who continue not only to drop the bombs, but to manufacture the bombs. Because many companies in this very state are the ones that are creating the bombs and sending them around the world to kill our siblings. Shame. 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 Shame! 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 And we have a special opportunity. Being in this state, being this close to the Capitol, we have a special position to say we will join ranks with others around the nation and in fact the world to say not on our watch and not in our name. A final thing I, I just have to say, I'm grateful 
for those of the faith community who are standing here. And I'm in prayer deeply for Jewish comrades who are seeing something done in your name and perverting your faith and identity as bombs drop. I'm thinking of my Islamic sisters, brothers and siblings who may at times feel powerless as the latest rounds of atrocities are reported, most notably from non-Western news sources. And I also think about our church communities. And I just want to put a call out, and y'all help me spread the word. If I can be honest, I've been running the race for social justice for a long time in this city. And I gotta say, I'm tired. I'm tired of when these types of issues coming up, I'm tired of being one of the only black pastors that y'all got to call. Amen. There is no reward in that for me. My ego does not need that. I wish I was one of many. I wish there were so many that you could call anybody and their congregations to be here as we lift up, celebrate, and worship that Palestinian Jew, Jesus the Revolutionary. Yes. Yeah. Let's support and hold up each other. Because there's an external solidarity and there's an internal wrestling as well. And the only way we finish the marathon of this type of movement is by staying together, seeing the big picture. Palestine today, Sudan tomorrow, the Congo the next day. And don't you let anybody tell you it's mission drift to put your commitment and your solidarity to the black and brown people of the world who might not be in the locale where your focus is on one day. It's all connected. It all runs together. And so I, as I finish, and y'all should know black Baptist preachers say it at least three times before we're done. I can't ask you now if I'll see you when the news change because you're here. I can't ask you when celebrities and entertainment takes the mic, will you still be here because you're 